Hi again, in this video I'll be covering both bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis. Just like both asthma and COPD, these two are both classified as obstructive diseases. Don't forget to like and subscribe down below, links to my Instagram, Facebook and Telegram are in the description below. I'll go over the essentials of bronchiectasis, their pathophysiology, the causes, signs and symptoms, the investigations we use before finally moving on to the management. Bronchiectasis is a permanent dilatation of the airways due to an inflammatory insult like an infection. The inflammatory insult then destroys the elastin and cartilage causing it to weaken and dilate. It's characterized by recurrent acute infection and bacterial colonization. This is how the airways look. You have the trachea, bronchi and bronchioles. If we were to take a section of the bronchi and put it under a microscope, this is how it would look. This is the bronchi of a normal person without bronchiectasis. Going from the outside inwards, we have the adventitia, which is made up of connective tissue, the submucosal layer containing both the C-shaped cartilage and the smooth muscle layer. And this is the bronchial gland, which secretes mucus and serous fluid into the mucosa. The innermost layer is the mucosa, it's made up of the lamina propria, also called the basement membrane and the epithelial cells, called ciliated pseudotrachified columnar epithelium. The lamina propria is where you'll find the protein called elastin. What elastin does is it allows the bronchi to return to its original shape after stretching or contracting. As we take a closer look you'll find the goblet and serous cells which also secrete mucus and serous fluid and on the epithelial cells you can see these hair-like projections that come off the cell called cilia which is one of the defensive mechanisms in the respiratory system. Cilia moves the foreign bodies, dust and particles that have been trapped by the mucus back up the airways to be swallowed by the esophagus. In bronchiectasis the trigger which could be a foreign body like bacteria or virus enters into the airways which causes the airways to inflame and remember any infection will cause an inflammatory response from the body. As a defensive mechanism, the airways will try and clear out the microbes, but it will prove to be ineffective. As a response to the inflammation, more mucus is produced due to enlargement of the mucus superheating cells. The mucus is more thick, obstructing the airways, forming a mucus plug. The mucus hypersecretion is accompanied by ciliary dyskinesia, which means that the cilia's mobility is impaired, meaning there's reduced clearance of the microbe. The microbe will begin to settle and form a colony. This will then result in chronic inflammation and destruction of the elastin and cartilage in the bronchi. The destroyed elastin and cartilage causes the bronchi to dilate permanently. When it comes to causes of bronchiectasis, the most common is infection, bacterial infections like pneumonia, TB, pertussis or viral infections like measles, influenza and RSV. Congenital diseases like cystic fibrosis where there's a thick mucus built up making mucociliary clearance quite difficult. The mucus builds up allowing the microbe to form a colony and thus trigger an inflammatory response. In catagenous syndrome it's also quite similar, it's called primary ciliary dyskinesia. Other causes like allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, immunodeficiencies like those with HIV will present with a more serious recurrent infection. Connective tissue diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, Jorgen syndrome, asthma, gastric aspiration, bronchial obstruction are more rare. They present with coughing up of a copious amount of permanent sputum and non-specific respiratory symptoms like shortness of breath, chest pain and hemoptysis. The signs include clubbing due to it being a chronic disease and on auscultation you'll hear crackles, mostly in the lower zones, crepitation and wheeze because of the obstruction. High resolution CT is the gold standard and the diagnostic test, but we'll need to do other tests like CVCs which will show a raised white blood cell count due to infection. Sputum culture will help us to determine the causative microbe. Spirometry will assess the lung function and its reversibility when used with a bronchodilator and chest x-ray may show tram lines and cysts but can also be used to rule out other diseases like pneumonia and pneumothorax. This is a normal x-ray of the chest. As you can see, the bronchial tree isn't dilated. In bronchiectasis, you can see dilated bronchi in the right lower lobe 
which we call the tram line or tram track sign. So a patient with a history of recurrent infection and chest x-ray showing the tram track sign is bronchiectasis until proven otherwise. High resolution CT is what we use to diagnose these patients. It will show us a clear picture of the bronchi. In a person without bronchiectasis, you'll see non-dilated bronchi. In bronchiectasis, you can see the dilated bronchi quite clearly. Now, management. Although it's not a risk factor, smoking should be stopped as it worsens the symptoms. Physiotherapy and the use of mucolytics are used to aid mucus expectoration. It's important they get their pneumococcal and influenza vaccines because it can exacerbate an attack. Broad spectrum antibiotics like ciprofloxacin can be used if they show signs of infection. If they have more than three exacerbations a year, you can put them on long-term antibiotics. Bronchodilators will help us to assess the reversibility of the disease and can also improve symptoms. And in advanced cases, they may need surgery. Now, we'll move on to the last of our obstructive diseases, cystic fibrosis. We'll cover the essentials, the pathophysiology, its clinical manifestation, the investigations and diagnostic modalities we'll do on these patients, and finally, how we manage them. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease, an autosomal recessive disease to be exact, meaning both parents must be carriers for it to present in some of the children. It affects multiple organs like the organs of the respiratory system or GI system. It's a disease in paediatrics, but seen as they're tested for this right after birth, they're diagnosed really early. They have a life expectancy of around 41 due to the progressive nature of this disease. It mostly affects Caucasians, but this doesn't mean other races can't get it. These patients have a genetic mutation in the CFTR gene, which stands for Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Conductance Regulator, which is a chloride channel. There are many different types of mutation, but the most, most common in Caucasians is the DF508 mutation. In this diagram, we can see the epithelial layer. We have two channels which allow transport of ions in and out of the cells. Sodium passes from the lumen into the cell via one channel and also carrying with it water. And chloride moves from the cell into the lumen via the other one, which we call the CFTR channel. In cystic fibrosis, there's a mutation in the CFTR gene causing the CFTR channel to not function properly and therefore chloride doesn't leave the cell, resulting in it building up within the cell. Chloride is negatively charged, so the cell starts to become negatively charged. To counterbalance this, more sodium will enter the cell, dragging along with it more water. This results in a thick mucus plug. A similar process also occurs in other organs like the intestines, pancreas, gallbladder and salivary glands. In newborns, they usually don't show any symptoms. If symptoms were to show, they may present with failure to thrive, meconium ileus and rectal prolapse. Any patient with a history of meconium ileus is cystic fibrosis until proven, proven otherwise. In children and adults, they may present with cough, recurrent chest infection due to bacterial colonization in the thick mucus, bronchiectasis and pneumothorax and in advanced cases they may show respiratory failure, hemoptysis and core pulmonale. In the GI the secretions are also dehydrated like in the pancreas you have pancreatic insufficiency, the pancreatic juices are dehydrated and thick making it difficult for the enzymes that amylase, lipase and protease to travel to the lumen. The steatorrhea is because there's no lipase in the lumen to break down the fat. The protease that remains in the pancreatic duct can damage the pancreas, causing pancreatitis and diabetes. There's deficiency of fat-soluble vitamins due to lipase deficiency. In the gallbladder, there's bile stasis causing inflammation and stone formation. Other manifestations include infertility, mainly in men, due to absence of the vast difference delayed puberty, nasal polyps and salty skin. CBCs will show a raised white blood cell due to infection, they'll have an abnormal bleeding profile due to vitamin K deficiency and if they show any signs of infection we can do a sputum culture. Chest x-ray to look for bronchiectasis or pneumothorax, spirometry will show an obstructive picture, abdominal ultrasound can detect a fatty liver or pancreatitis. 
Most babies born in the UK are tested for cystic fibrosis at birth via the Guthrie test using a hill prick sample. If the results come back positive, the next step is to do the sweat test and the CFTR gene test to confirm the diagnosis. The sweat test is the gold standard test and must be positive on two separate occasions to diagnose it. If the Guthrie test is negative, the next step is either the sweat test or gene testing. Managing these patients should be a multidisciplinary approach consisting of a team of GPs, specialists, nurses and dietitians. They'll need chest physiotherapy and mucolytics to help clear the airways, physiotherapy like chest percussion and postural drainage, bronchodilators will help reduce the obstruction, antibiotics can be used as prophylaxis against staph aureus or in acute exacerbation. A high caloric diet and supplementations like vitamins and enzymes and in cases of polyps, nasal steroids or polypectomy. And that's it for this video.